Hello everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeffrey and uh, Professor Tai, thank you for this opportunity. Today I'm, I'm going to present to you some, uh, just some bullet points of some work I've been working on for about eight years. The name of my, of my thesis and my body of work is Societal D of Development and uh, the human condition on the road to nowhere or somewhere. So oftentimes we look at, at uh, development as this thing where we, we build and it's always seen as this positive thing, but uh, I want to look at what is that D word. The material I'm going to present today is the concepts and the ideas of what I've been looking into and why. I just want to show a brief video and you can see. Take a, just take a moment's pause, right? And take a look at people who still represent something that's inherent to, to human beings. We're all living creatures for that matter. And we can take, just take a moment's pause just to think about the value of our heritages, the value of our cultures, the value of, of our ability and capacity to live in community and with one another and and I'll use the word regulated by by our natural environment um, I think that has a lot of a lot of value a lot of potential together we are about to travel to locations rarely seen by the public eye up to the high mountains of northern Thailand There, communities of indigenous peoples have for generations been living relatively traditional lives. Their unique cultures are vanishing, however, as they, like those in the urban areas below them, are becoming ever more part of a modernizing trend. Global market forces and government policies are in a sense forcing villagers to shove centuries of indigenous knowledge aside and adopt modernized, developed lifestyles in order to survive. They are trying their best to maintain traditional ways while adapting to an encroaching modern world that is pulling them in one television program at a time. However, as the village elders are fading away, their indigenous knowledge with them, the middle-aged community members want to preserve the culture for which they feel responsible but may not know how, and the younger generations are looking to a world outside of the village for examples of how to survive in a modern world society, many of these communities overall are amid a very tangible identity crisis, and their future is uncertain. This is a global issue. The future of humankind is also uncertain, as the economic market-related decisions that humans have been making for generations are rendering like never before very tangible effects on our reality in terms of our natural environment and overall social functioning. If we are going to find creative solutions to global challenges, then let's focus on the root of prominent global issues. What is transpiring in developing parts of the world has long since happened in first world developed supposedly more advanced societies, namely issues related to environmental degradation, material acquisition, economic inequality, and poverty. Here we must prioritize, what do we humans really want? For ourselves, our neighbors, and especially for our future generations. This project focuses on the D of the word development. What are development-related processes taking away from what is essentially the essence of humankind? Our unique cultures, our traditional ways of life, our connection with nature. What are the replacements, both negative and positive? 
This project is proposing that more traditional cultures, particularly those of indigenous peoples, whose communities represent a nature intrinsic to us all, can potentially serve as a contemporary social scientific measurement of how all of humankind has been affected at our core by modern development related phenomena. This conversation can be initiated by remembering where all of us really come from, and it isn't the city. We can begin by listening to indigenous voices from an age range and from different ethnicities and about how their communities have been impacted by modern economic development. Here are some of these voices. Briefly about myself, my professional background is that I'm a civic journalist documentarian, media artist. Now I focus on development impacts, particularly related to social change patterns. And I've been, for about a decade, doing various roles in media. My formal education is, uh, I have a Bachelor of Science in Mass Communications and Social Psychology. So it's a, a double major where I wanted to look at how do people think, how do they react to their environment? And then I use media as a way to communicate to uh, the public audience about those things. Uh, also had a stint in Hawaii, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, as a East West Center scholar. But at that time, I, I left there to go back to Thailand, where I've been living since 2010, to learn more and uh, become better prepared for what I'm looking at now about development studies. I Spent some time in Sarajevo, Bosnia. If you're familiar with Bosnia, it's a part of Europe that was um, ravaged by war for a long time. And it was then I started to become realized of how people uh, adapt to things that are happening outside of their control. And then I moved to Thailand in 2010. And at that time is when I started looking at development and changes that were happening in society and environment that had already long since happened into back in where I come from in the USA. So I started getting on a motorbike and traveling into different areas on the Thai Burma border with refugees, different things, and eventually uh, I started looking at um, indigenous and rural Thai communities that were being affected by rice paddies being filled in with concrete to build in condominium complexes and different things like that, that to me were just completely foreign because it had already been happening while I was growing up. I put it all into a book and this is essentially what the concept of what I care about. And it's indigenous knowledge. And he says, only after the last tree has been cut and there's nothing left, we, then we realize that it is money that cannot be eaten. That is a main motivator for me. So the societal via development, what is the concept? So while modernity and lifestyles are common in a place where I come from, there are areas uh, in the developing world uh, that still function on the margins of globalization and modernization. So we can go into these places and look 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, maybe back where the country I come from, or the National Geographic specials I've been watching since I was a kid. I was seeing this stuff in Northern Thailand. So what could be considered modern or traditional can still be observed in these areas. Unlike where I come from, these processes have already taken place. Things were already modernized. They already look developed. They already are a certain way. And, but people in these locations, although modernizing, are in part still using indigenous knowledge for their survival. And to me, as a sociologist, my background, that is fascinating. Because it's for this short period of time, this window of time, we can observe these different, I see them as stages, with the climb stages, of how people are interacting with each other, how they're interacting with their natural environment. You can observe this now. And I think in a period of time, Something else will have happened, but this is a very unique time. And so industrialization and capitalist expansionism is perforating the social fabric of the developing world and these 
communities and people. So people are departing from what I call the root connections with nature and each other and their survival and are depending more on global market linked systems for their survival. So what happens when they de depend on global linked systems too much or maybe that's a judgment in certain intensities, then their ways of social functioning are in a sense re replicating or looking like the way people function in my home country and it accelerates people's um, well, development is what it's called. Uh, ethnically traditional lifestyles then are hence being replaced by homogenizing world culture. That's my perspective. I see it that way. Uh, my heart for this, why do I care? Is because I love nature, I love life, and I love people. And I see this traditional wisdom of people who know how to live within what I call the laws of nature. In other words, when you know how important our respect for the nature around us that gives us life, when we know that, I think it causes us to behave in a certain way. Not only is it truly sustainable, it also gives us a certain kind of respect for one another as well. So if this traditional wisdom and our intrinsic nature and our connection with each other becomes lost, then what, what hope is there for any of us? Right? So what could this uh, world homogenization process possibly mean for all humans? What happens if the, if the world like becomes one homogenous blob in a way and we're all looking into our into our phones and or, and we continue on this journey. What happens when that happens? And to me, that is one of my primary questions. So, to make this practical, how can community planning coexist with and yet maintain natural resources and the integrity of a community's root cultural makeup and ultimately improve quality of life for current and future generations in a rapidly developing world? Many people have looked into this, yeah, but if I can do it in, a, in an artistic way, a media way, a certain kind of grounded way, then I can communicate a message to maybe even societies like where I come from. I was very happy after moving from Burma to this village 37 years ago. We were one of three households living here at the time. It was very quiet. Life was good. I worked in the tea plantation. I lived simply growing rice and collecting food from the forest. I didn't have to buy anything, just salt. Now I have to buy nearly everything, including vegetables. Villagers, for the most part, just don't live the loud way of life anymore. It's just not the same. Everything feels different, except during the New Year's celebration. Many things are changing. People are becoming more selfish, thinking if they do things with others, that there will be less for themselves in the end. The cultural harmony isn't as it was. What will come of this village and the Lahu people? I don't know. I'm not a god. <laughs> Uh, hypothesis. 
Um, I've been kind of pulling this out of the air over the years, so I'm here to develop this more, but I hypothesize that these traditional communities, uh, what we would call a traditional community, uh, can serve as a social scientific measurement for how all of uh, humans have been uh, impacted by development. So what does that mean? It, it's a context. This is a societal, social, environmental context for looking at internal processes. So I hope that going into these communities, which I'll show you a little bit about, and looking at how those processes are taking place, that we can understand. And then when we understand that, um, I think, I hope that that can be added to models of information that have already been created about how to uh, maybe give some community some, some foresight into what will happen to them if they make these certain kinds of decisions. When the road goes in, how is it going to impact? When the electricity comes in, how is it going to impact? Uh, I want to combine social science with uh, environmental science, like ecology, environmental quality, and if I can link these together, if I can overlay those, not just talk about the social, not just talk about the environmental, but if I can directly link these through academic concepts, academic lenses, then I can, I can undoubtedly link our connection with nature. Because so oftentimes humans say, oh, nature, 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 as though it's some kind of external thing. Right? We're all nature, we're all part of this. My analytical thought base, um, I've been trying to figure out over the years what the heck is development, really? What does it mean? So when I first started doing this, I could just think about, oh, back in the US, uh, Joe puts up a huge, cuts down all the trees, puts up a huge uh, garage, fills it with trucks and cars and stuff. That's development. It's good, right? But uh, finally, after coming to this department, I finally started to really look into what is development. And this guy says that um, development is an organized intervention in collective affairs according to a standard of improvement. And after being in Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Bosnia, um, these Southeast Asian countries, I understand what that means. So I interpret this as organized intervention means like social policy, international, national, local. Collective affairs means culture, so aspects that people care about as, as uh, Professor Tai helped me understand more about policies and education and economy and standard of improvement, which is the institution in various aspects. So when we have development, we say, oh, we want to develop our community. But in actuality, what is happening is this. People have a way of doing stuff. There's an outside force that feels that for the benefit of the country or the economy, there's a better way of doing it. So we're going to find ways on a policy level to change that because they believe that's for the better of a community. And to me, I just simply call that ethnocide in, in some aspects of it. From, a, from my person, of course, there's good things that come with that too. There is education, there's health care, there's things like that. But in essence, it's ethnocide. What happens with development? Well, the land is commodified, so there's some kind of some kind of crop that that's, creates a, a market system. That market system requires people to do certain things, and for people to do those certain things, there has to be certain infrastructure in place for that to happen. And the goal of it is to make it more efficient, more, more profitable, really. And people here now are subject to the market system that everybody in the world is really subject to. With materialism, you start getting uh, competition, social status, different things like that. So therefore, your, your motives start to change of the things that, that you're doing, right? Do you, do you think it's easier to actually see ourselves when we look at the way they live here? Whether we want to believe it or not, we're all subject to the natural world. And... 
development through technology in a sense insulates and isolates us from from the reality that we are all subject to the natural world and these are people that are we can still look we can still observe we can still see people that i think represent represent, represent that that um that baseline that we all human beings share so each of these hill tribes indigenous people groups they have distinct cultures they still have traditional language dress dance music some foods what is the the, the point in maintaining this uniqueness and do you think it can be done how are we ever going to reflect upon ourselves if we don't take a moment's pause to take a look at who we are who we really are i mean where we re where we really come from it's not the city we're not machines we're not robots but we're turning into that we're becoming mechanized by in in proportion with the global market system so we're, we're becoming like like robots and, and we're all aware of it we don't like it the Jedi still continue to put gas in this machine that grinds about every day from sunrise to sunset and continue to uh, perpetuate the very environment that we dislike and inherently know is not us. That to me is just madness. With this materialism, it's creating division within the communities. And hasn't that happened all over the world? I mean, I mean, I can only reflect on the country that I come from, and it's all about territory now. It's about what you own and what you've worked for, and and you know what you have more so than what you can share. And it's that seems to be the you know the trajectory of this of this development continuum. You have a homogenization of culture. You have a homogenization of of language, you have, you know, this kind of things turning into just one shapeless blob. And what 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 happens when that happens? Granted, I like electricity and hot showers and aircon too. I'm not saying that. That that I'm saying that we should all just go back to living in, in you know living in nature because what I learned through this experience is that it's tough for these communities to live in these environments. It's like a double-edged sword, so to speak. You know? Yeah, they have their social structures and they have their, this natural way of life, so to speak, but it's really difficult for them because of the market system. Uh, and is it because it, their way of life is what we could call more simple or, or the contrasts are bigger? I, mean, I don't know that their lives are more, are more simple. Looking at it from a sociological perspective, you're seeing the very things happen here that you see in the West that are materialism related. When you have competition, when you have the market system that is driving people, the root elements of people's behavior, you wonder why you get things like social stratification, why you get conflict, why you get drugs and other social issues, why you get these things the root of that. I think it's because people are disconnected from what they inherently need. And that is a connection with our natural environment. It's a connection with each other. It's a connection it's to feel a wholeness and a, and, a, and a connection to the world in which we live. And I think that, I hope that this project has, has value in that sense. In the very least, being able to to appreciate ourselves. Some theoretical questions. So these are the main questions that I'm that I'm answering with with what I've been looking into the past six or seven years. Um, so I'm looking at the word "de" of development, denoting removal or reversal, or the, a, a new stage in a changing situation. So what are development processes uh, taking away from human cultures and traditional ways of life, and what's the replacement? So when I was looking into this, I was this. I'm viewing this before from a, as a journalist, a journalistic perspective. What are the short and potential long-term impacts of status quo development processes? And what's most important is what can be done in the earlier stages, as I said earlier, to um, 
to pad some of the effects of these things that happen and maybe need to happen. People can't live nowadays back as they did a hundred years ago. I've asked community members that, well, this isn't this ethnicity, how come you, why do you choose this? And they say, some people resist, but they suffer. It's the system, it's very strong. Um, so the third question here about what can be done is about how bottom-up other development-related principles to postmodern globalization is an alternative de development model. Is it even possible? That's what I'm looking at now. Objectives, um, so to combine my, the background of social sciences with social, or with um, uh, environmental science, in, investigate our changes in landscape, uh, affect relationships amongst ourselves and with our natural world, um, and compare the, uh, combine and compare the analysis of community development processes um, with the analysis of changes in ecology base. So I explained that earlier, when we have the environmental and we have the social, but link them directly together and show, okay, when this policy changed, this social aspect changed. When this environmental aspect changed, this social as aspect changed. And to link them, to show the combination. And analyze how the village is connected to the urban area. So how am I going to do this? I'll explain my methodology. Um, I want to uh, look at infrastructure. How does the road and technologies um, link people with the globalized world? And how has this led to societal state shifts. So when does a community suddenly switch over into a different function? And the communities that I've been looking at are, many of them are in between. But I've been looking at kind of different perspectives, mostly on, on particularly road impacts, um, how they say that, oh, the road is good, but there's not necessarily a lot of real concrete proof that it is actually good. Even though in the short term, maybe people can run their crops out easier, maybe they can go to the hospital, maybe they can do different things, but it also leads to other things I think that are often overlooked. And that, uh, in particularly, is the minds of people. And I've talked to pe many people about this as well. So what happens when the villagers now have, especially the youth, are kind of trapped, some of them, I'll just use that word, in these communities? It's the same as my hometown. Why did I get out? Why did, do many people get out? It's because they have ambitions, but the environment doesn't provide that the resources necessarily or the opportunities for them to make those ambitions come to reality. So you feel a pressure. You want to go out into, you want to, like, you love your community and you love your culture and you love who you are, but then you have the force of, in this, in this context, the Thai state trying to pull you into a main uh, national culture quite aggressively in some cases. What are you going to do? So you're under that pressure and you wonder why youth are you know, doing drugs on the edge of the community, why there's conflicts, why villagers now on the road jump on motorbikes that they bought on loan and fly down out of the mountain at 90 kilometers an hour drunk or on methamphetamines and hit a tree and die. Why do these things happen? Okay, so that's what I'm looking into. And there's many good things that come with it too, okay? But I think these aspects can be overlooked. The methodology, how the heck have I been doing this with no funding? Um, uh. <laughs> we just figure it out piece by piece. Uh, and I believe in what I'm doing, so other people believe in me. I've had some help, and it's also just I've extended it out over a long period of time. It has not been easy. So to talk with you today is actually uh, I've been a long road. And I'm ready for this. And uh, it's time. So I've been, now I'm doing this in a two-part development problem and some potential solutions comparative case study approach. I think this is a, a good way to to not just talk about all the negative stuff, but also really illustrate that one village area that's in the typical development model, and then another area that has been also subject to that model and gone through the same processes, but is developing in a different way. One is a rural project area, 
So in other words, if it's in a Tyro project area, it has been forced onto them, this chain. This other, this other well, that's one aspect of it. Um, and then another area where those same processes have taken place, and there is help from government, non-government, and local communities. So this is the, this is the ecology principles um, that, that I want to apply. And how has that community adapted to national policies, adapted to development change, different things in a productive way. So I use uh, photographs, in-depth interviews, videos, and mostly voices. And I also look at different villages and different, uh, different people, different age ranges, different villages, and different aspects, different parts of the development module. Um, so here's some of the main villages here. Uh, one main case area is called Nam Ban Nambur, or not Nambur, no, um, uh, Pung Moon Village. It's a, I also met the princess of Thailand in this place. She's been up there many times. Uh, the Xing, this is a royal project area. This is a border area that, why did the Thai government take three, uh, that's for the next presentation, but it's a very, very key area in terms of uh, eradicating opium production. Okay, so this is what I mean by low, medium, and high. So all these photographs I've taken in my journey. So uh, low, look like that, medium, high. So no road access, easy access, full access, low power electricity, high power electricity, social dynamics related to exposure to mainstream Thai society and also global pressure. So what is happening in their minds when now they're looking at the Thai soap operas on, on high power television versus you know 10 years ago when they were doing looking at you know low power um, solar power technology with black and white TVs. Before that it was fire. <laughs> okay, so it changes the way they interact with one another. And different this think this is the main aspect of it. So I looked at youth, middle age, and elders. So I have all of their voices. So in my in my book, I, actually I forgot it today, but in my book it shows these different mindsets of people living in different they're in the same situation, but they have different perspectives on development. So you have the youth that are, like I explained, they're kind of in an identity crisis in a way. How do I fit into the main world? Geez, if I continue to be Lahu, I don't want to have a soldier pointing a gun at me at a point at a, at a checkpoint. I don't want that. I want to speak. To, I want to be Thai. I want to be Thai. That's it. I want to be Thai. And the middle age are in between. So maybe they want to preserve the culture, but they don't necessarily know how. And the elders for the most part are like, who are you? Yeah. I don't recognize that person. And these are some of the people that I've been learning from. So I looked at particularly one area over a, a period of about 135 years to look at how, uh, how in certain stages of this area were certain policies, certain, and the ways that the environment was and the way that the so society functioned, and how did that change? And as I looked at that, I saw that it seemed to be a transition towards degradation, social degradation. And now the community is monocropping and they have all kinds of social problems that uh, I studied in my sociology background. Why do people shoot at each other? Why do people uh, steal? Why do people do things? I don't think it's because human beings are inherently that way. It's social conditions create that. And yes, we need to have responsibility for our actions, but I think that uh, we need to look to the roots of those, of those motivators. So I want to look at ecosystem services. So look at the same timeline. This is the social part of it in the 1880s. This is what ecosystem services. So what does nature provide for human benefit and well-being? So like 1880s, it was like this. In the 1880s, it was like this. And to show the same, the same time period and link. This is how I'm going to actually do it. So that is in one area, and then the second area, as I mentioned, is a comparative case study that's a potential solution. So real briefly, I'll just uh, talk about this area. It's in another part of Thailand. It's near Nan. It's uh, maybe four or five hours from the other area uh, that I've been in northern Thailand. That I've been. So this is still in northern Thailand, but it's, it's in a different province. After I left Hawaii, I went back to to Thailand, I started working with an NGO because I wanted to 
feel working. I wanted to do things. So this NGO brought me up to this area. They've been working with this community for a long time, over 10 years. And I've been to many communities in many different areas, and I never, ever before saw this. They are taking lowland crop cultivation techniques, uh, and, they, which is, and then they're making tiered rice paddies up in the highlands. And to me, it was, well, what was that? So I went back. Uh, I always knew I wanted to focus on that because at that time I thought it was completely led by a woman. So here you go. You have not only do you have this innovative uh, way of, of adaptation and, and uh, an illustration of resilience. I thought at that time it was specifically to climate change. I'm really interested in the climate change adaptation strategies of people living on the margins because they're the ones that are that are affected first and most. Anyway, I went back another time and I realized that there's actually an old man in the village, Pan, 80-some years old, who's been doing this for 50 years. And it's a, it's a great example of people changing, completely changing their ways of life in some aspect to adapt to modern pressures. So it's kind of like your community where, where you're, okay, capacity building and changes in governance versus government. It, this is another example of that in a different way. So this community, they're integrating adaptive practices into old traditions. Now that has all kinds of issues as well because you, they're animists. So one of the first questions I ask is, well, what about the spirits? And, and they, they still respect that kind of aspect of their society, but they are now completely changed. Land degradation, uh, food and water security, as well as climate change impacts are primary issues. So these are same issues as the other communities, um, but they're adapting to it in a different way. So just real briefly, this is my main man I'm going to talk to when I go back for the third time is Pan, really interesting guy. And then, of course, I'm working with NGOs and the woman down on the right, I need to talk with her because this is definitely a, a gender a, a case of... Uh, Gender empowerment as well. So the old man has been has been doing this for 50 some years, but they said, "Oh, you're crazy. This isn't the way to do it. This isn't the way we traditionally do it." And she uh, utilized some training from an NGO to learn how to do the tiered farming. So she went against the traditions of her culture as a woman against her husband, against everyone, and I, from what I understand, I need to learn more about her. But for one year, hand dug those fatty. And now she's become you know, a very prominent person in that community, but I want to know how that's impacted her. So, resilient adaptation and sociopolitics of environment, wisdom from the hills, that's what I call it. Versus the community just doing it on their own, you have another uh, example of multi-level governance and other development. So I think this is a successful case of government, non-government, and village-level collaboration. So now I have to, I have to go back. I can talk a lot about the other communities. But I need to go back now again, and really find out some very specific things about how this community has adapted and some of the details. Particularly, uh, I have right now a perspective of the non-government organization. I have the perspective of the villagers. I need to get more of that, but I'm completely blind at this point to the perspective of the government. So these. These, this community has been under subject to, if you look at this from a global and scale perspective, now they're under climate change, regional climate change policies and pressures and different things like that. So I want to find out about that more. So in conclusion, um, shifting the development conversation to being uh, about overall global society, uh, changes in relation to transitions in ecosystem services over well-being, landscape ecology, uh, and the way socio-ecological socio systems and traditional knowledge has shifted. Um, I think by looking at this uh, has great potential for providing tangible community-centered solutions regarding the issues that human beings face overall. So I want to take what I learned from this and bring it to a place like the US, Europe, other places that, uh, that I think could learn a lot from these people you could learn a lot from Taiwan, especially. You could learn a lot from from these communities that I think are too often overlooked. 
especially nowadays. I want to provide a story that links people who aren't familiar at all anymore with those ways of life. If I can link them and I can put show all oh, people living in this environment that uh, I can't relate with, I can see how they live. I can relate with that. I love my family. I love my dog. I like my home. I like vegetables. I like clean air. I like that too. If I can link that in people's minds anywhere around the world, then I can collapse the barriers that are created by people believing that we're so different. I view it as people who, old people, especially older people who have this indigenous knowledge and ways to survive, as they go, it's like knowledge that's rooted into millennia of our history of how to function in the world is like sliding into the sea. Chunks of knowledge that's vital for our survival, just like the icebergs. So I feel an emergence right now to go in and do what I can to document this, to reflect upon this, and try to communicate a message about it before it's too late. The end for now. Okay, thank you.